Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Welcome into the GSMC Basketball Podcast, right here on the GSMC Podcast Network. It is your host, Bryce Lewis, back again to talk about and discuss everything with you regarding the life of basketball. And today we have a pretty, you know, I think a pretty good show for you today. We're going to talk about KD and James Hart, you know, playing, they're playing very well together. Um, they look like a dangerous duo already. And that's what makes them look impressive. By the time of this recording, I must do a disclaimer. They haven't played Milwaukee yet, so I have no idea how they're going to do against Milwaukee. But they, I expect them to have another good game. And they're going to get tougher competition, so it'll be interesting to see how those two work. But we're also we're going to talk about that performance and how they looked and how, if they continue to look at moving forward, how dangerous the Nets could be. We're going to talk about Kyrie coming back as he is ramping up his conditioning to be able to make it back. We're going to talk about Luka. We're going to talk about how bad the breakup really was in Houston from the Houston side of things, not just from the Harden side. Victor Oladipo still hopes to end up on another team at the end of the day. The NBA looking to expand rosters because of because of COVID and other NBA news during today's show. So thank you for tuning into the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Thank you for being part of our day. And let's go ahead and jump right into it. So, as as... You know, I was talking about Kevin Durant, James Harden played their first game together as teammates against the Orlando Magic. KD had 42, James Harden had a 32-point triple-double. They looked fantastic together. And so, after seeing that type of performance, it kind of makes you sit there and say, I see why not everybody views Brooklyn as the team to be the favorites in the Eastern Conference because of how they played. If they can play that dominantly and that efficiently, There's literally no team in the Eastern Conference that can stop them. Now, the key to this entire equation, again, to me, is Kyrie. Because when Kyrie comes back, remember something about that game. And I just want to point this out. In that game, obviously, KD had 42, James Harden had 32. The next highest score point total was 17 by Joe Harris. So now imagine if Joe Harris was Kyrie. Would he be okay with 17 points? You would think, of course, if he had like just an inefficient day, that's different. But what what if he only got maybe eight shots? What if he only got maybe 10 shots and scored 17 points? Would he be fine with that? Because Kyrie is a volume shooter. That's going to be, I think, the biggest question for the Nets moving forward in that position. Because you've already seen just with KD. Just with James, they've already played together. There's already chemistry. Yes, we may have thought it's been so long. It was Oklahoma City. Their games have changed. But at the end of the day, you don't think they work out together, ball together in the offseason. They have some chemistry playing with one another. The biggest thing really here is overall, I think they have to figure out if, if Kyrie is willing to sacrifice and James, and KD, this could go. Because honestly, you've seen it with Miami. Sacrifice is needed for everybody to be successful. Golden State, sacrifice is needed. And within that offense, not really that much sacrifice, but basically just saying, I'm not going to have a big night every night. Somebody else may have a big night that night. And so, and I may not have a great night, but that's okay. And that's going to be the question with, with this big three. But, I think... You know, obviously the biggest concern for Brooklyn, even after the trade, is defense. People think defensively they're they're lacking a little bit in the interior. It was a problem before the trade, but now they don't have a great interior defense. In addition, in general, they feel like you have three offensive-minded players, even though KD's a very good defender. You know, James has improved his defense, but we don't look at him as a great defender. Kyrie, we know, isn't a great defender. Not because he doesn't play defense, but sometimes he doesn't put, always put his effort into defense. Plus, Kyrie is a smaller player as well. 
And so it's going to be a very team collaborative effort for them if they want to be successful in the defensive end of the ball. Now, really overall, for the most part, I think the Nets look like a team that, you know, the Nets look like one of the best teams in the NBA. And um, if they continue to success, I expect nothing more but for them to be there at the end of the day. You know, and when you have that type of offensive firepower, you understand why people sit here and say, listen, they may seem like on the pap- on paper they may could potentially have chemistry issues, but if you really have three people who are willing to work together to make something successful with the talent that these three guys possess, the Nets easily could be the end up being the favorites and potentially be in the NBA Finals, as, as at this point is pretty much an NBA Finals or bust type of season for them now. You know, the Nets are going to be there, and they're, and they're going to be competing hard, and they're going to hope for the best. And now also, with more news on Kyrie, Kyrie has now, we finally know Kyrie's coming back to the team. He was potentially going to play Saturday, but then the NBA ruled their verdict on him finding him and etc. So right now, Kyrie is ramping up his conditioning, trying to get himself back into shape before he plays as he hasn't played for about almost two, about two weeks. And so he's wrapping back, repping up his conditioning. He's not going to play against the, the Milwaukee Bucks. So hopefully in the next game, the Nets play, he'll be able to come back and play. And then we'll finally get to see this, this big three on display. We'll finally get to see this big three all together as one and see how they, how they do. I think that's going to be something to me that's going to be extremely interesting. And I think is going to be, you know, I think that's what everybody wants to see. You know, I, I think, you know, of course, Hart and KD, I think, can work well together without a Kyrie because everybody else is a role player. But that's why I said it's going to be interesting to see what happens when now the third star, the third the, the third big name comes into the picture and is now there. And he's now, you know, trying to get his shot and get his, his game going. But actually, this could be a good thing in the grand scheme of things because since Kyrie has to get himself back into game shape with with James, with KD, he doesn't have to push himself too hard and he could kind of ease himself back in because it's not like he's the second option, so I got to already go back out here and be the second guy and score with KD. He could come in here and say, if KD and James got it, I can kind of just you know work on it, just work on some cardio. Obviously, I'm not saying he's just going to be out there doing nothing, but um, you know what I mean. You know, He could just do everything else. And then work on his game, slowly get himself back, and then he'll be good to go when the, when the time comes for Kyrie to maybe have to play, you know, big minutes. Uh, you know, obviously with Steve Nash, it he'll probably do the thing that a lot of two teams do with big threes. They'll keep one of the big three on the floor at least for with the, with the bench unit, so they always have a guy that you have to worry about. That's where I think if Kyrie and is going to have most of his opportunities when James or KD go off the floor or both. You know, he that's going to be his chance to kind of get some shots up, kind of get his his production. I think with them all three on the floor, he's going to have to take a little step back. But if he's up to second or first, I think he'll be good to go, and I think he'll be able to do what he has to do in the, in those times. And then I think that's something that you you see with some players in certain situations. You've seen it with Kyle Kuzma and in in, in 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 L.A. I mean, not from a star perspective, but because think about it, he's only getting 18 minutes. So if he wants to score, he has to score at the time he has allotted. Because first of all. When he's also with that bench unit, outside of when LeBron or AD is in the unit, he's probably the second best offensive player. So he has to. That's when he has his opportunities to make plays, get a shot up, do some things. You know, I'm talking about last year's team. This year's team, you can make an argument: Montrezl Harrell and Dennis Schroeder would be the first two options on the bench, or in that second unit. Even though Dennis is a starter, then Kyle Kuzma. But you know. Last year's team especially, he had to work on that. And I think this is what Kyrie's in this year, where he has to come out there and he has to basically just work with what he has when he has his chance, take his chances, because that's basically what they would need from him in those times. And they'll have to hope for the best in that at the end of the day. So, you know, we'll, we'll have to see, like I said, what happens with that situation. We'll have to see what happens with the Nets. Hopefully they continue to press on forward, continue to be impressive moving forward, and they'll be good to go. If not, you know, like I said, if they don't make it to the finals, it's looked at as a bust of a season. And obviously, you know, the Nets don't want to have a bust of a season. So, you know, it's one of those things where 
you just got to hope for the best if you're in the Nets. Hopefully health. Health is obviously a big issue. You got to make sure that health is good. If the health stays good, team stays good, you'll be good to go. Because that's the key to every NBA season is health. But luckily with them with three stars, if Kyrie had to miss a few games or KD had to miss a few games or James had to miss a few games, they could still say we still got two out of three of the best, some of the best players in the NBA still being able to play for us. And we'll still be able to win the game just as much as if we only had all three. So that's something that the Nets can hang their hat on. And then before we get out of this segment, I want to also talk about the Milwaukee Bucks. The Milwaukee Bucks, if you remember how they started the season, they didn't start the season fast. They kind of started it kind of slow. I believe they were 5-5 five and five at a time or whatever, 4-4. Four and four. They, they were kind of 500, not looking like the same Milwaukee Bucks. It was the beginning of the season, obviously. you know They didn't really have much of a training camp preseason, so they were probably working some things out. Now they have one of the better records in the NBA. They look like the Bucks team that we have seen from previous years. They've looked a little bit more dominating. They played very well. Drew Holiday seems to be adjusting to his role very well. And that's really, you know, what they, that, that's what that's what they're hoping also comes about in the playoffs. Now, obviously, like I said, they have a big game against the Nets. Like I said, the Milwaukee's 9-4 right now, beating Dallas, beating, you know, Detroit the last two games. They've, they've played very well. Like I said, they've played very well. They're playing up to the level that maybe people saw them as. That's why Milwaukee, in my eyes, I feel like is going to be a top four team in the Eastern Conference, if not top three at the end of the day, because you know regular season at least. They're a very good defensive team still, and now their offense is coming with them, and now they're winning games. And, you know, they're a team that, listen, we know at the end of the day, Giannis is going to have to prove himself in the playoffs. He's going to have to show that he can make shots. He can be just as effective and dominating in the playoffs as he is in the regular season. He has to show he can shoot and have a respectable jump shot. Clearly, free throws are still a big issue as well. He said the other day when asked about how to fix his free throw issues, he said shoot more. So we'll see what that means for, for Giannis's game moving forward. Drew Holiday being that veteran leader, one of the best two-way guys in the guards in the league, can score. And I, and I said the thing that ultimately is different right now with Milwaukee is the fact that last year it was, it was Giannis, Chris Middleton, then Eric Bledsoe, and then Eric Bledsoe was just not reliable. Now you have a more reliable guy in Drew Holiday that now is the second option. And then Chris Middleton, to me, is the third option. So you have a much more reliable second and third man than you did the last previous the previous years. And that is what Milwaukee is hoping is the difference in their playoff success is now if Giannis does struggle, Drew can get his game, and Chris can still have his game, and they can stay afloat as a team with the supporting cast. And then if Giannis could just do enough, they'll still be just as competitive and be able to win some of the games they may have not been able to win the last few years. So hope they're just hoping for the best with this team. They're hoping that they continue to move forward and grow and continue to get better. And if they do that, they'll be good to go. And Milwaukee, like I said, is like second a top four team. And we'll see what happens when they when they go against the powers, you know, in, in, in the Eastern Conference, like a 76ers, like a Boston, like a Brooklyn Nets. Because that those are the teams they're gonna have to go through to get to that 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 finals appearance. Giannis would be big for his career to get through that especially getting through Brooklyn with three stars, that would be huge for him. But it's going to take a complete team effort. Chris Middleton, Drew Holiday, if they stay healthy, they have to play their A game. And we're going to have to see how the chips fall when they get to that time in April. But that's all the time we have here for this segment. Coming up next, we're going to get into some more NBA news. So stay tuned right here on the GSF State Basketball Podcast. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome 
Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Last segment, we discussed the Brooklyn Nets, how great Harden and KD looked in their first game, how dangerous of a team they're going to be, but obviously having to figure out the issue with Kyrie when he gets back. It's going to be different when your third leading scorer is, is Joe Harris with 17. You don't know how Kyrie's going to respond if he was getting 17 on a nightly basis as the third option, so we'll have to see how that works out with them, but they're definitely a dangerous team if they work it all together, and, and deservingly so should be the favorites coming out of the Eastern Conference. We also discussed the Milwaukee Bucks, how at the beginning of the season they started a little slow, they've picked it back up, but we know, you know, at the end of the day, what's going to matter is the playoffs, Giannis' success, how he plays, Drew Holiday brought in to be, a, 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 to me, a second option, consistent, you know, basically upgrade over Drew Bledsoe, Eric Bledsoe, and you know, just hoping for the best. So we're going to have to see what happens with the Milwaukee Bucks when it's all said and done as well. But before we get into that, I'd like to remind all of you, please don't forget to follow us on Twitter if you want to keep up with us at GSMC underscore basketball. That is GSMC underscore basketball, where we can keep up with us, talk about all the latest things happening in the world of basketball. So please don't forget to follow us on Twitter at GSMC underscore basketball. So, I want to talk about, we obviously know the James Harden trade and how that ugly that ended. And we talked about how James was, how James felt, what James was doing. Now I want to kind of talk more about Houston and, and their side and the teammates and the players who played with him during that short time. Because, you know, James Harden had his introductory, his introductory Nets press conference and, and said that, listen, I've been in Houston a long time. They just got there. You know, they haven't been through the stuff I've been through and know the stuff that I know and and, and et cetera. Obviously, we saw DeMarcus Cousins come out and, and talk about how the disrespect, he was disrespecting them way before an interview. And, you know, even John Wall even had to say, you you, you never bought in. You know, you, 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 ne- you never tried to give it a chance. And so, you know, I, I just want to kind of give my insight onto that situation from that, from Houston's side, the player's side. Because reportedly there was also a report that Cousins and Wall confronted James Harden before the trade in a meeting. So clearly, you know, clearly from what, everything we've heard, James Harden was clearly confronted a lot by teammates. We knew in training camp we heard about the arguments, throwing basketballs at teammates. Clearly teammates have already from the get-go were just tired of James Harden. And and I think it's and I think that's why everybody feels so you know feels the way they feel for Houston because you got guys who are willing to give it a shot, buy in, let's give it a shot, see what happens. And it felt like James never allowed himself to truly give it a shot. And you know I think that's why overall a lot of the the Houston players were upset. Because they were like, you didn't even give us a chance to be good. You just basically just said, well, I'm looking at it on paper. I don't think we're going to be that great, so I don't I don't want to be here. Remember, we heard that one of the reported reasons why he wanted to leave Houston was just because he thinks they can't beat the Lakers. Well, there's a lot of teams that can't beat the Lakers. But if you're that guy that Harden thinks he is, you would think, Harden, shouldn't you be able to get your team to be able to compete against the Lakers? And you know, obviously, this game came against the, the the he got traded after the game against the Lakers, where they got blown out. But like I said, Hart average did not score more than twenty points in his last four games with Houston. Clearly, as a teammate, you know how what James Harden is capable of. You know what he can do. You know what he is able to do on a night to night basis on the offensive end because you've seen it for years. If you were on another team on the team, etc. And just to now see him check out, not put his best foot forward, not put the effort in, not try, be lazy, you know, all that, it's it's frustrating. I'm sure it's extremely frustrating for every player that was on that team, especially the new guys. Listen, what's interesting, we never really heard what a guy like P.J. Tucker said or Eric Gordon. We never heard a lot from them. You know, remember, he's been, they've been with James through these playoff wars. You know, they, they've been through it. You never really heard what they said. You heard more of what the newer guys, like a Harden, 
a Boogie Cousins said, even other teammates probably that are newer to the roster. But you didn't hear a lot about the guys who have been there and how they felt about how James Harden was treating the situation. You know, obviously, you know, reportedly P.J. Tucker is is under, you know, consideration for the Minnesota Timberwolves, thinking about potentially pulling a trigger for a trade for him. You know, could Aaron Gordon even be on the move as well? You know, that these are all possibilities. Now, over, if we look at this Houston team, John Wall has played well when he's played. Christian Wood looks like a beast. You know, everybody was making a big deal out of the fact that Shaq said he's not familiar with his game, and then he called Shaq a casual. But Christian Wood has been a big pickup. There's a reason why a lot of people felt like, even though he never really played in the NBA consistently outside of, you know, Detroit for a short period of time, people looked at him and said, this guy has the potential to be one of the better big men in the league. And he's right now, he's, he's, play, he's playing like that right now. So Houston has some building blocks moving forward. They obviously have a lot of draft picks now. So obviously that's that's something that they're excited for. They're glad that they have, you know, and we'll have to see how this team continues to look throughout the season now that they kind of have, I guess, a person who wasn't bought into what they wanted to do, not out of, out of there. And they can truly, you know, try to build this thing the way they want to with the new leadership and the new direction and new management that they have. And, you know, for me also, I think, on on Houston side of things, I think one thing that people criticized Harden about was how he was affecting the new head coach. You know, you have a new head coach. He's trying to build something, you know, to have a successful have a successful tenure in Houston. And you being the face of that franchise basically saying, I don't want to be a part of it, I'm not going to buy in, it, it just looks like it's disrespectful because you're, you're, you're basically telling the new guy, I don't want to help you. I, I don't want to be the reason why we're successful for you. I want to be on another team. And so I understand, again, why people may have felt the way they felt. So, you know, Houston, you know, they've obviously a lot of things have happened. But 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 I think now Houston can now as a team focus. They can just they could just go in there, play their heart out, play the system that Stephen Salas wants to be played. And we'll see how good this Houston team is, even without James Hart. I've, I've even made the argument with some people I've talked to about this, that I think Houston could still be in, in that mix to get into that 10th spot. Because I, I, don't, I don't think this team is like devoid of talent, where they actually have no talent whatsoever. I don't, I don't think that's the case with this team. They have talent. It's just, you know, with, with the locker room chemistry being messed up, with James not buying in, you know, he's, he's, he's taking minutes from other guys who may be bought in, and he's giving a half effort where they would give full effort. You don't know if that may have may have potentially made a difference in some of the games that he played in. And so, you know, for me overall, I think James, he's a guy who, you know, he, you know, he, he got what he wanted. He's in Brooklyn. He's able to play with KD. But Houston finally can now build what they want to build there. Uh, listen, this this is a chance. This I mean, because really this this team that they have in Houston is more of I almost look at it as a kind of a redeemed team. You know, people thought James John Wall was washed after his injuries and after his Achilles. Coming back, trying to prove to people he's still one of the better point guards in the NBA. DeMarcus Cousins has had injuries ever since being traded from Sacramento. Just injuries that have kept him out, year-long injuries. He hasn't really been able to consistently get on the floor. But when he has played in little uh, flashes these last few years, he has still played well. And he played, he's played well when he's played, you know, this year as well. You know, you got, like I said, Christian Wood, a guy who was in G League a lot, got some time in the NBA, but never really gotten a full opportunity to prove himself. Now he's proven himself. You know, you got you got a lot of guys on Houston who are trying to prove themselves. And so you have a motivated team with a new young head coach. That sometimes can equal great success for a team because you know that, you know, people are buying in because they all want to prove something. They all want to show that, hey, we're, we're, we're better than what you think. You know, we have a chip on our shoulder and we're going to come out there and we're going to compete every game. And it's going to be a dogfight playing the Houston Rockets night after night. Even if they don't end up getting the wins, there's just knowing that the teams can't come into Houston and say, yeah, this is an easy win. They got to come out there and know, listen, we got to battle against these guys. These guys are one of the best teams to play in in the NBA in terms of night in and night out. If we want this win, we got to earn it. And so... It'll be interesting to keep an eye on Houston this year to see how they develop, to see what happens, and to see you know how this team develops throughout the year and potentially moving forward, and seeing if they maybe could get, like I said, to that tenth spot. 
potentially in the Western Conference and maybe even make a chance to even still make the playoffs as well. And then when I transition to this, Luka Dantich. Luka had a triple-double in, 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 in his last game. Played great. Played great. You know, played fantastic, really. But they lost. They lost. And, you know, Luka came out after the game and said, I was selfish. They lost by 16 to Chicago, 117 to 101. Luka had 36, 16, and 15. But he did go thirty of thirty for thirteen of thirty from the field, and I and I just want to say to Luca, in in, in that game, it, it, don't don't think you were selfish, man. If you look at, if you look at that game, you didn't have a lot of support. Literally, outside of Christoph Porzingis, who's coming back from injury, scored twenty. The next highest score were was Willie Carl Stein with ten. Your two top players got 36 and 20. That's 56. Outside of that, the highest outside of that was 10. That's not on you, Luca. You just didn't get enough support. You just didn't get enough support. And I don't think he should feel like that he was selfish in that situation. Because sometimes it happens. You don't think Harden's had big games where he scored 50 and lost. We've seen Clue Bradley Bill dropping 62 and losing. You know, that's just at the end. Sometimes in those games, it's not even about you being selfish. Selfish is if, if someone was open multiple times and you just kept shooting the ball and not passing it. That's selfish. But if you had it going that night, you were the best player on the court that night, and you just did what you had to do to put the team in a position to have a chance, there's nothing wrong with the way you play. You just didn't get enough support from your supporting cast. And sometimes during the NBA season, that happens. Sometimes players have big nights and they just don't have enough support from the other guys and they still end up losing a game. So, but I understand why he said it. He probably felt like, listen, I had all these great numbers. I did the rebounding, assisting, and scoring. And, you know, I was selfish. You can't, to me, you can't have 15 assists and you're selfish by yourself. 15 assists. You had to pass it to somebody. That's not being selfish. So, like I said, I understand. He's just, he's, he's a very humble guy. And he doesn't want to come off like, oh, yeah, I'm having great numbers. Now, he could easily just say, yeah, the numbers are great, but we lost. And so I need to do better to put my teammates in position to win. But, you know, going ahead and saying selfish, I hold off on that a little bit because that's not being selfish. You just did what you thought you needed to do that night. It did not result in what you wanted it to result in. But at the end of the day, you can always bounce back. There's plenty more games. You're going to have plenty of big nights. Your supporting cast is going to play better than they played in this last game. And then you just got to take that and move forward, move forward. So I think, you know, Dallas will be fine. And listen, they, like I said, they have one of the best young guards in the league. And you know, like I said, it's a very exciting and a very great thing to watch Luka Doncic play because he's a great watch. So that's my thoughts on that. But I actually want to expand more on this topic next segment as I, I want to discuss, about, talk about more about the supporting cast in general with certain teams, plus other NBA news as we continue here on the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Last segment discussed. James Harden in Houston. We talked about it from Houston's end, how Houston felt when James Harden left, you know, the players in the locker room, especially John Wall and Boogie Cousins, who were the most outspoken about it. We discussed that, how from their perspective, my insight on how they felt about that entire situation. 
Also, we talked about Luka Doncic saying he was selfish for having the type of numbers he had, but still resulting in a bad loss for Dallas. I said to Luka, listen, it's not you, it's the team. They just didn't give you a great support that game. Outside of Christoph Rzingis, I mean, nobody else gave you more than 10 points. You can't, I mean, you can't You can't do anything with that. So that, that kind of brings me into this, my next topic about, you know, the supporting cast. And what I mean is just, you know, these performances happen all the time where you'll have a big performance and you don't get enough support. And obviously, depending on where you are in your career, depending on the situation, sometimes you're going to feel frustrated. Uh, examples. Like a recent example, Trey Young in Atlanta. Before this year, he would average 30, uh, either 30 a game, but literally outside of John Collins and maybe Kevin Herter sometimes, maybe a Cam here, it, it was really not that much offensive support. And so it was a lot was on his shoulders to score or else they weren't going to get enough offense. Uh, LeBron James back in his first stint in Cleveland. You know, this man, you know, LeBron does everything. Scores, rebounds, assists, play defense, all at that time in his career. And yet it still wasn't enough because the supporting cast did not give him enough to be able to win. And, you know... I think players go through this all the time. Think about Kyle Anthony Towns. You know, he's he's developed into one of the premier bigs in this league. But we know he doesn't have enough supporting cast in Minnesota. Plus, again, playing in a tough conference. But again, not enough support. Remember, before this past year, really for the most part, even though we saw Phoenix building, they, for the first three, four years of Devin Booker's career, didn't give him a lot of support. It was basically him scoring every night and barely getting enough from everybody else. So you you clearly see through those examples, a lot of teams are in that position where they have this guy who balls out, has a big night, and still loses. Because usually, on good teams, you'll have a guy who plays very well. Like, if LeBron and AD have big nights, they're unstoppable because their supporting cast is good enough where if they do their thing, they should be able to pretty much win every game, you know, for the most part. Now, if you play against a team that's equally as great, then obviously that that varies. But for the most part, if they play up to the level of their potential, they should be able to win. Same thing with with Brooklyn. That's why Brooklyn's a favorite. If KD, Kyrie, and, and James play up to their level, they dominate, they score, Brooklyn should win the majority of their games. They should win in the playoffs because you think their max is better than everybody else's max. But then think about James. Even with him being the main scorer in Houston the last few years, he still had a very good supporting cast. That's why he could drop 40 and a lot of times Houston win. Playoffs obviously is different because you're playing teams that are just as good as you and so now, yeah, he may go off, but the other guy's guy may go off, and then it's supporting cast versus supporting cast. But in regular season terms, it's usually good enough to win the majority of your games. You know, and so that's why it's easy to sit here and say, okay, supporting cast wise, okay, someone doesn't have enough. Someone isn't getting enough support from a guy or from a certain team or certain players to be able to win. You know? We, we talk about with Bradley Beal all the time. How Bradley Beal is out here having great games. And that it's not, it's not resulting in Wizard wins. Because he doesn't have enough support. He doesn't have enough guys who can carry their part good enough where he can do that. And then it results in wins most of the time. And so I think that's kind of, you know, the thing that we're at right now with these teams. You know, supporting cast has to show up. That's honestly, to me, why a lot of the time I think teams are willing to have top-heavy teams because they're like, if we got guys who can really dominate the game and make our supporting cast not have to give as much, we are going to be successful. 
Think about Golden State. If KD and Steph drop 30 each, that's 60. Clay could give you about maybe 18, that's 78. Draymond give you 10, that's, that's 88. Between those four players, they're a good defensive team. And all the supporting cast may have to do is give them 20, 25 points. The rest of the starters in the bench, just 20 to 25 points. If that's good enough to win most games. Where you got Giannis, remember, he gave you about 30 a night. Chris Middleton can give you 20. That's 50 between the two. But you still need about another 50, 60 from everybody else. What's more on the supporting cast? Supporting cast has to do more for them to be successful. You see what I'm saying here? That sometimes is what separates the great teams from the good teams. That's why LeBron and the Lakers are so successful. AD and LeBron can both get 25, 30 each, by between 25, 50, 60, player, 60 points between the two. Kuz McGee, 8 here. Morris gives you 10 here. KCP gives you 12 to 15 here. Dwight gives you some putbacks, maybe 8 to 10 there. It kind of starts to pile up. Now you're equaling the same amount of points that your stars are giving you. Now if they if they score 50, you score 50, that's another 100. And you got another guy who drops maybe another 8, 6 in there. And then it just kind of builds. Kind of builds. And then you have enough support to win. And so, you know, that's why it's important. And I think that's why you see the difference in certain teams. Even with stars, star player here dominates, loses. Star player here dominates, wins. Supporting cast is the difference. So their supporting cast is much better. And is able to give them enough support where those type of performances are usually good enough for them to win games. So, you know, I just want to talk about that real quick, about the supporting cast. Give a little slight little importance on how important a supporting cast is. Because it's, it's extremely important. It's extremely important. So, you know, like I said, Luke is not going to get that type of support every night in terms of the lack of support. There's going to be nights, the regular season's a long season, you're going to have those games. But that's why I feel like you shouldn't take that kind of blame. I feel like he was selfish when it's just like, listen, if your teammates ain't got it at night, your teammates ain't got it at night. And so either you got to do more on your end or it's just not going to be your night. But now let's get into some other news. Victor Oladipo. Victor Oladipo. They say, obviously, a lot of people talk about that trade. A lot of people are saying that Houston may stay to still trade Victor Oladipo by the trade deadline. And it is also reported that Victor Oladipo may still want to end up with the Miami Heat. He says his end goal is to end up there. So now it brings to the table, are the Rockets going to actually trade Oladipo to the Heat? Are they willing to buy out Oladipo? We don't know. You know Oladipo only has a year left on his deal. So I, as far as we know, Houston isn't necessarily right now trying to re-sign Oladipo. So, for the most part, he's going to be gone. So, you would think Houston would at least try to shop Oladipo by the trade deadline. You know, obviously the Heat haven't looked as good as they've looked looked last year. So, they may be in the market to make a move, potentially to bring another guy with, with how everything's looking. This summer, when they first found out Oladipo was interested, they really weren't Jumping on that opportunity, they really weren't saying, okay, let's let's really go out of our way to try to get Oladipo. Now, they may say, okay, what the team is on, with Jimmy Butler, Oladipo, that's not a bad combo. Got maybe Draga, Janair, Hero, okay. Depending on what you got to give up, you make the deal. You know, maybe maybe the Heat can maybe make another push at the end of the season, potentially to get into the playoffs. So you got to take that into consideration as well. You can't you can't underrate that potential you know opportunity. So overall, I think, you know, we'll have to see what happens, clearly. But, you know, Oladipo clearly still wanting to be with Miami Heat really shows a lot. And we just have to see if maybe potentially he ends up getting his wish. He's able to end up getting there. Because I'm sure he wants to be there. I'm sure he wants to be a part of it. I'm sure he wants to help contribute to the success of that team. So we'll have to just keep an eye on it and see what happens moving forward. 
And then lastly, before we out here for this segment, the NBA is looking to expand rosters due to the COVID outbreak that has happened on certain teams. Washington, just seventh person, just tested positive for COVID. This is a rule that would benefit them, increase the roster size. So maybe you could maybe bring in an extra two to three more players because obviously, you know, they're trying to hope to make sure, you know, we won't continue to have postponements. You have to have at least eight active guys to play. Obviously, you're seeing a lot of people are testing positive. So now they're like, okay, well, maybe let's expand the rosters to help increase the chances of, you know, games still continuing to be played. I think, you know, obviously the NBA, they've, they've changed protocol. They've changed different things according to what's been happening recently with the COVID, kind of a slight outbreak within the NBA. And they're trying to do anything they can to stay on top of it and make sure that it doesn't end up being disastrous for them at the end of the day. So, you know, overall, I think they're just trying to do what they kind of do to, like, reduce the damage of what's happening. And, listen, they discussed this before the season, potentially. Because, remember, before it was just having every player on your roster active. Now... It's let's extend it and let's allow it to have more players. So this may give the opportunity for certain guys who've been trying to get themselves back into the league to get a chance to get a spot on the team. Now they may be the 15th, 16th, or 17th man, but they have an opportunity. And a lot of these guys, it's really all they want at the end of the day is an, is an opportunity. So that's going to put people in position to potentially make a new home somewhere because of the COVID outbreak. And, you know, having to see how that goes and how everything turns out is going to be very interesting and very important moving forward. But that's the update on that. So that's all the time we have here for this segment. Coming up next, we're going to get into some more basketball news. So stay tuned right here on the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Last segment broke down the supporting, talked about the supporting cast. You know, just how supporting cast really can affect things teams affect wins, losses, the, expecting, having certain expectations for your supporting cast, all of that, we talked about that, I also talked about Victor Oladipo wanting to still hopefully end up in Miami, will the Rockets trade him to Miami, we don't know, but as far as we know, we don't think the Rockets have any plans to actually keep Oladipo around long term as he's entering the last year, or he is in the last year of his deal, so that's probably something to keep an eye on around the trade deadline. And then the NBA looking to expand rosters because of COVID. Everything that's happened because of COVID, they're looking to go ahead. Like, let's go ahead, open the rosters up a bit. Get a couple more players so we don't have as many proposed postponements in games. I mean, think about the Wizards. The Wizards haven't played in a week because of so many, really because of injuries and because of COVID. So, you know, it's it's been, it's been rough. But, you know, the NBA is still working their way through it just like everybody else is. And now I want to get into the power rankings right now from Leach Report, the Page Report, Power Rangers, break down the top 10 teams on their list for this segment. So that's what we're going to do here. And we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. Number 10 on the Bleach Report list, power rankings, the Portland Trailblazers. Portland, past week, went 3-1. and one. Now, they've been dealing with some injury issues. We obviously know Nurge is going to be out for a few weeks with a wrist fracture. C.J. McCollum was lost against the Hawks, and he's going to be out for about a week, even though he's having a career year right now, averaging 26 points a game. You know, Portland is a team that you look at maybe Tier 2 teams and think they're the best of the Tier 2. You got Damian Lillard, who can have a big night. We saw what he did in the bubble last year. Well, not even last, well, yeah, last year. We, 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 we know how good C.J. can be. 
you know, with a fully healthy Portland team, I think a lot of people were interested to see how good this team would be if they were able to be fully healthy. Dirk just had a lot of injury issues. If he can stay healthy, he'll be big. He's, he's a very, you know, skilled big man. You got CJ who can score, Damien who can score, you know, Roddy Hood playing this year. I know a lot of guys that didn't play last year, you know, they have Trevor Reza, you know, a lot of guys, well, not Trevor Reza, but Robert Covington, you know, and Covington hasn't even played that well for him since he's been on Portland, so they're looking for him to find his shot. And so Portland really is a team that, you know, really looks really good or something. They, you know, they look like a team that that's very competitive and their team that will probably be hovering around probably the top 10 spot all year long because that's what I'm saying. They're a top tier two team and they're they literally just depends on the week for them because like I said with Damian and CJ they'll always have a chance but right now they're going to get through this next week with some injuries and hopefully they can hold up and really show the depth that they maybe have on this team moving forward as they're going to definitely need it if they're going to try to really move up the rankings then we have at number nine the Phoenix Suns now, the Suns are coming off a really bad loss this past week, losing by 32 points to the Washington Wizards. That was shocking to a lot of people. Phoenix, at one point, had the best record in the NBA. And they look like a team that's just like, wow. And I've, I've been saying on this podcast, the Phoenix Suns look like they could be the third best team in the Western Conference. Because there's no definitive third team. And I always said that Phoenix could be that team with Devin Booker and Chris Paul. But right now, they're going through the typical growing pains of a team that's learning to win. Right now, you can kind of tell by through the games that Portland has played this year, they kind of play up and down to their competition. They're not consistent yet, which is a part of the young growth. You have Devin Booker, who's young. He's never won at a high level before. DeAndre Ayton, you know what I'm saying? A lot of guys on that team never been in that position. Only Chris Paul. So Chris Paul's really going to have to show his leadership here. He's going to have to be like, all right, guys, when we go against teams like this, we got to get up for it. We got to win this game. We got to take care of business. We can't have these lackadaisical performances or we're going to get blown out the building like we did against Washington. But overall, like I said, they're a really good team and everything. And right now they're dealing with some COVID-19 protocol stuff. So that was the only game they played. So it's not really great that your last game was that loss, but they can still improve. They can still, they can still continue to move forward. And I expect Phoenix to have things figured out by the time the playoffs come around. And like I said, they're going to be a very interesting and a wild card team to look at in the Western Conference because, like I said before, their team, to me, like I said, could be the third best team, could give Wash- could give either the Clippers or the Lakers maybe a tougher challenge than some people expect with the way they're constructed. And so definitely something to look out for and something to keep an eye on moving forward as well. At number eight, the Indiana Pacers. So Indiana, as we know, you know, a good team. Now, it's going to be interesting how they continue to look without Victor Oladipo. Because, listen, the guy they traded for, Kyle Savert, has a small mass. And he's going to be out for a minute. And so they're going to be going with basically they're down one guy. You know, Miles Turner didn't play. And we'll see where the Pacers end up. The Pacers usually every year, regular season-wise, for the longest have always been doing a very consistent, really good team. Especially this year offensively, they've seemed to improve all their numbers offensively. So offensively, they're a better team as well. We're just going to have to see what happens when when Karis LeVert gets healthy. We're going to have to see how this team meshes together. And and listen, nobody's expecting the Pacers to be a championship team, but maybe this year, you know, like I said, the last couple of years, they've been swept the last few years. That's they, they, they at least want to be more competitive in a playoff series. And I think with this roster of the all-stars they have in Brogdon and Sabonis, I think they have a great chance of doing that this year. So I think they're definitely a team that you have to look out for when it, when it gets all said and done and it comes down to it. Then, at number seven, Utah Jazz. I think we're seeing the ascension of Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell's played very well. He's a guy who we saw his coming out party really against the Denver Nuggets last year, balling out. Because he he's he, the way this team was constructed, he has to kind of play this way for them to really be as good as they could potentially be. They're usually a team that is built defensively, and then you have that one main score, and you have shooters. And that's kind of the thing. And then one thing that's also been very big for them, last year, Michael Conley, 
did not play that well, was injured, did not play well, couldn't find his rhythm last year. This year he's playing much more better. He seems much more comfortable within the offense with Donovan Mitchell. He's going to be a big key contributor to the Jazz if they want to be able to make it past the first round this year. You know, Donovan Mitchell is averaging 23.8 points a game, shooting 47% from the field. Jordan Coxon's almost averaged 20 points in the last week off the bench. They have three guys they can need, they need to score. Clarkson, Conley, and Mitchell. Everybody else is just, can we get enough from everybody else? Because right now they're on a five-game winning streak. They're playing really good basketball right now. But they just need everything to come together for them if they want to really, truly be able to compete at the end of the day against some of the best teams in the Western Conference. Because they have a guy, Donovich, they just paid him. Listen, we all talked about the Rudy Gobert extension. A little questionable. Don't know if you want to pay a guy like that. 12 points a game, $200 million, Okay, whatever. But... We'll have to see the Jazz look really, really good right now. And and, and that's and they're a team that is also battling potentially to be the third best team in the Western Conference. At number six, the Boston Celtics. Now they've been dealing with some COVID protocol. But and and, and they just got blown up by the Knicks. But, you know, they'll be fine. Remember Tatum Brown currently, you know, going with the COVID protocol. Two best players. When they get back, Boston will be fine. Boston will be fine. They're, they're, they're going to be there competing with the best teams. I wouldn't be surprised if it's them in Brooklyn East Conference Finals. You know, it just seems like Boston always finds a way to get there. Kemba Walker getting some playing time. You know, his health is going to be big. They need, especially with Gordon Hayward, I feel like now they're definitely going to need Kemba Walker to beat Kemba Walker. You're going to need your top three scorers to do what they got to do, and you got to hope that you're going to get enough from the supporting cast for them to really truly be a team that can seriously compete in the Eastern Conference. They're a young team, but they've gained some great experience these last two years, and, and they don't want to hear that them being young is an excuse anymore. They want to finally go ahead and move forward and prove themselves and do what they got to do to you know get to where they want to go at the end of the day. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with this team moving forward. At number five, we have the Philadelphia 76ers. Sixers look good. You know They, 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 they started the year great, had the COVID issues, so they had they didn't have death, lost some games, but they're still decent. They're still good. You know, Embiid's playing at a high level right now, and I think that's the biggest thing for them is Embiid's playing at a, at a at a dominating level. He's going to be the key, and if Ben Simmons can you know improve his game, at least be more effective offensively. I think everybody wants Ben Simmons to score more. This 76er team again could be in the debate to maybe be that other team that goes against the 76ers semifinals, Eastern Conference Finals, depending on how all the seating works out. Because they definitely have one of the most dominating players. And then so they'll have a mismatch against Brooklyn with Embiid. Embiid could drop 30 a game, 40 a game on them. It's just going to be everybody else. Can they do enough to beat that higher power of the Nets? At number four, the Los Angeles Clippers. The Clippers, you know, we know what the Clippers are. They, they're playing well. They're a solid team defensively, offensively. Ty Lue really has these guys, I think, buying into what they're trying to do. Last year, obviously, the biggest issue with the Clippers was buying in. Paul George seems like he's trying to he's on a revenge season. He's trying to prove people that he's 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 he's, he's better than what y'all think he is. He's not this pandemic P that y'all say he is. He is playoff P. Now everybody's gonna say, okay, Paul George, we've seen you in the regular season. What are you gonna do in the playoffs? That's when Paul George is gonna have to make his money. That's when Paul George is gonna have to show everybody that extension he got was worth it. The Clippers are hoping that he makes a return on that investment and he plays well. Steve Ballmer is doing what he has to do to get this team in position to win. And we're going to have to see if all pays off for him. Ibaka's look good. And the offense has been really good. They're one of the few teams in the league that when they pass the ball, have over plus 25 assists, they're one of the best teams in the league. And that's one thing I think they're trying to definitely do. Like last year, you saw a lot of ISO. Now they're trying to be more of a ball movement offense. Defensively, they were a great defensive team. They still need to do a little bit better, obviously, with, with, with rebounding and defense. But it's something they can continue to improve throughout. The Brooklyn Nets are third. Obviously, they move all the way up this list just because of the performance of James Harden. You have to, I mean, they're probably, unless they start to struggle and have a losing streak, they're probably going to be a top five team all the year long in people's power rankings because you just see this talent. You just say, how can we sit here and say the Nets are not one of the five best teams in the NBA? Especially after what we saw, Kyrie Irving coming back. This team looks like a very dangerous team and a team that definitely can really carry and go forward and go far. And so you definitely got to look out for the Brooklyn Nets. Again, a team that is expected to make it to the finals coming out of the Eastern Conference. And listen, with these with this talent, they're a team that is going to be very. You know, you have to have a lot of, you know, confidence to go against them. 
At number two, the Milwaukee Bucks. Like I talked about earlier in the show, Milwaukee's been playing much better basketball of late. They've played a much, much better basketball of late. Like I said, started the season a little up and down. They seem to have found their stride. Their offense is starting to hum. They have the best offensive rating in the league right now. And it's even higher than Mavericks' offensive rating from last year. Uh, so, so, I mean, that shows you how well they're playing. You know, Middleton, Giannis, and Drew are playing great. And they're still getting some good supporting cast help from Dante DiVincenzo, Pat Collington, who's shooting 48% from three, and Brooke Lopez as well. So they're going to need all these guys, like I said, in the playoffs to show up because that's going to be the key if they're going to make it far in the playoffs. And obviously we hope that Giannis, you know, Giannis is a guy who works hard. He'll continue to work on his free throws. Hopefully he can get it up. If he could get it around 70, 75%, that's more respectable. And we'll put him in a good position in that position. And then at number one team, especially is the Lakers. The Lakers are just playing great right now, playing great defensively, playing great offensively. And they just, they look like a dominant team. And a lot of people thought the Lakers were going to come into this, this season, take some games off. Okay, we're okay being a fourth seed. They seem like they're still playing to be the best team in the West. Number one seed, especially now since they can play in their arenas. And definitely look like the most dominant team. And so LeBron and AD are doing their thing. They have, the supporting cast is doing their thing. And this is the reason why people predicted the Lakers to be the favorites before the season. They just look really great right now. They play all three phases of the game. Defense, coaching is good, offense is good, leadership, everything. So the Lakers look like they are the number one team and deservedly so. They've played like the best team so far this season. But that's all the time we have here for this podcast. Thank you for tuning into GSMC Basketball Podcast. Thank you for letting me be part of your day. Don't forget to listen to our other amazing podcast here at the GSMC Podcast Network. This is your host, Bryce, signing out saying have a good day. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program